So there's a great story about a minister who got up in front of his congregation one Sunday and he said, I have some good news and I have some bad news. The good news is we have all the money we need to fund everything we want to do for the rest of the year and into next year. And even better than that, we have all the money we need and want to expand, to do all the things we want to do, to fix our parking lot and to do all the things that we need to do. But the bad news is, is that it's still in your pockets. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. So, <laughs> so today, I am talking about money. And, and I hope that the way I want to talk about money may be a little different than you might have heard from ministers in the past. Uh, I hope so. My experience with ministers talking about money is that it's all about how can I get you to give me more of it. And that's really not what I want to focus on today. I think unfortunately, at least this is my own opinion, that unfortunately many churches, and I would say any, even many spiritual centers, and even some in the New Thought movement, Talk about money from a place of lack, lack consciousness, a place of fear. Although many of us would categorically deny that, we don't want to come from a place of fear or a place of lack about anything. Especially that's what we teach in New Thought, that it's all available to us. We live in a world of abundance. We are prosperity. But are we demonstrating that? And I think, unfortunately, many churches build resistance, foster resistance and resentment in people when they talk about money. Has anybody ever experienced that in a church? (laughs) Talking about money. Because I think, unfortunately, many churches use guilt or blame or coercion and even bribery sometimes to get money from you to us. Um, I'm not talking specifically about tithing today, the idea of tithing. Um, But I do find it curious that in the New Thought movement, that of all the scriptures in the Bible, that only that one little section from Leviticus 27 do we cling to and interpret literally. (laughs) Have you ever thought about that? (laughs) Everything else we will interpret metaphysically or metaphorically, but we want to hang on (laughs) to that thing about tithing. That's got to be literal. And I think that comes from sometimes a consciousness of fear. Now, again, I'm not talking about tithing per se today. But I think, and I'm not saying that tithing is not an important spiritual practice, but I think the way we approach it sometimes is probably not from a consciousness of openness and love and prosperity and abundance. So I may talk about that at some point later. So I want you to rest assured that I'm not talking today. I'm not going to try to use coercion or guilt or shame or bribery to try to get you to give us money. So let's take a breath. (sighs) So what is this thing? What is this thing that we call money? And why Does it bring up such stuff for us sometimes when we start talking about this thing called money? Because money really is just a thing. It is something that we made up. We made it up. We created it. It doesn't occur in nature. We created it sometime thousands of years ago. I looked it up and There's some evidence that there's some coins or some metal pieces that may have been used as early as 5000 BC, but the earliest uh, coins that were actually made for the purpose of exchange were in about 700 BC. So thousands of years ago, we created this thing because we needed a tool to exchange energy, right? I mean, I might have pigs and you have corn, but... I may not want your corn, and you may not want my pigs, so we have to have a means of exchanging. It's about exchange of energy. So we created it. 
And this thing that we call money has no or very little intrinsic value. Well, I don't mean to throw it away, but um, (laughs) see, it wants to slip out of my hand here. Um, This thing that we call money has no intrinsic value. We decide what what its value is. It also has no volition. This money, this $10, is not going to jump out of my hand and go buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Also, it's not going to jump out of my hand and give to someone who's asking for money on a corner. I get to decide that. You get to decide. You get to give your money the direction that it has. And so we decide its value. We give it direction. And it also has no inherent power. This little piece of paper has no inherent power. We give it its power. And so money is simply really a tool. It has no, we, we, we made it. We decide what its value is. We give it its direction. And we give it its power. Now, my thought is, my opinion is that we have given it a lot of power. We have decided that money has a lot of power. And so we often give it so much power that it can control our lives. We can give it so much power that it determines, we allow it to determine what we do, what we say, how we act, whether we are in integrity or in authenticity with who we are. I think of all of the inventions of humanity. I remember that question of all the things that man invented, what was the most significant? And I really do believe that money was probably the most significant invention of mankind, humankind, because it has altered so much about how we live. We give it so much power. When we think we don't have enough, we want more of it. And even when we have a lot of it, we worry about losing it or not being able to hang on to it. Right? This little piece of paper. And so when we think we don't have enough of it, and we grab, we want to get more of it, we sacrifice. We sacrifice ourselves sometimes. We sacrifice our values. We sacrifice our own life energy. We work many more hours in a week that depletes our energy, our bodies. It makes us sick sometimes. We want money so much that we will sacrifice the, the uh, environment for it. We will destroy parts of our earth for it. We will enslave each other for it. And some will even kill for it. That's how much power we have given to this little piece of paper. So, what do we do? What do we do about that? When we make money our God, we will sacrifice our highest values, our deepest values, and our highest intentions to serve that God. So what do we do? How do we look at money a different way and begin to experience it in a different way? Because it really is simply a tool, an exchange, a mode of exchange of life energy. I think, first of all, we truly have to get in touch with what are our deepest values. What are our deepest abiding values? And what are our highest ideals? And I hope, I think, my assumption 
is that those of us in this room who are focused on our spiritual journey, our spiritual connection, our connection with that divine life that is moving in us and through us and as us, when our focus is on knowing that, connecting with that life energy, God, source, spirit, the divine, whatever you choose to call that, and it doesn't care what you call it, but connecting with that, and as we are connecting with that, we know our unity. There's no accident that our movement is called unity. It's about oneness with God, with the divine source. And in that, oneness with each other. Unity, oneness with all humanity and not just humanity but our oneness with all creation the environment the earth the animals the plants the water our oneness with that and I hope as we come into the awareness that that is our highest value that out of that we value well-being not only for ourselves, but for each other. How we value the well-being of the earth and the environment, the water, the rainforests. We value those things because it is the expression of God. And so, I hope, beyond hope, that we will get in touch with that. And I believe that is your focus or you would not be here in this room today because that is what we're about, knowing that and living that. And then when we get in touch with our highest values, if our value is unity and oneness and the well-being of each other and the planet and the environment, then we can begin to infuse our money with that value and then direct our money, that energy, to those people and institutions and organizations and manufacturers and creators who embody those same values. And so we support the things that embody the values that we hold dear. But only when we're in touch with what we truly value. And I believe when we're in touch with what we truly value, we're also in touch with the love that that divine life is through us. And when we imbue our money with that value, when we consciously direct it to support those people and places and institutions and organizations that embody those values, then I believe the power of the money is increased exponentially. Because love is the most powerful energy in the universe. And so I believe that when we imbue our money with our values and with our love, it has more power to do good in the world for more people, for the planet, for the environment. And so we give money, imbue it with our values. We direct it to that which, which imbues, which supports that. And then it has power. I was reading, and I've been reading, Len Twist's book, The Soul of Money. And Lynn Twist is a entrepreneur, I mean a philanthropist. She has been working for decades with the Hunger Project, an organization to end hunger around the world. She and her husband founded the Pachamama Alliance, which is an organization that works with indigenous people around the world to save their their land and their environment and to save the rainforest, to work together. And so she's all about working with people and supporting people who imbue those values. In her book, she tells a story that I just wanted to relay to you because I found it very powerful. She talks about when she was 1970s, she got involved with the Hunger Project as a fundraiser for the Hunger Project. And she was invited 
to go to a church in Harlem, in New York, and to fundraise there. She said she felt a little weird about that because Harlem, traditionally, especially in the 70s, was uh, you know, a lower socioeconomic uh, culture. And so she felt a little weird about being asked to go there to raise money, but she was asked, so she agreed to go. And in the meantime, she got a call, maybe the day she was going, she got a call from a powerful CEO, a CEO of a, of a food manufacturer, a food company in Chicago, who wanted to meet with her. So she had to go there. And she, so she has, tells the whole story about how she worried about this meeting with this powerful man and how that was going to go and was she going to be able to tell him what was important about the Hunger Project and, and relay that and connect with him. And so she tells the story about going up to his office and sitting across the table from him and he's just sitting there, you know, looking at her, listening to her, but not ever responding really, about five minutes. And then he takes the check out of his desk that's already pre-printed and slides it across the desk to her. And so she takes the check, she puts it in her uh, briefcase and walks out and goes back to her hotel. She said all the time she felt weird, just an uneasiness about this whole exchange, this inter interaction with this man. She felt the energy was just off. So she got back to her hotel room, opened up her briefcase, and there was a check for $50,000 from this food company. But what she realized about that was that the energy of the money that he was giving her was really not pure. He didn't care about the hunger project. She knew that there were some issues with the company, some public uh, uh, perception issues going on with the company, and he thought if he gave the money to the hunger project, it would help his position, how, how, how they look in the world. And so she felt real weird about that, but she left it in her briefcase. She rushed to the plane to get to Harlem to go to her next engagement. And in the basement of this old church in Harlem that was leaking, and uh, it was raining very hard, and she said the, bit, the ceiling was leaking, and so it was people who she knew probably did not have a lot of resources. And she even says, she said, I always thought those people were poor. What I realized, I just didn't have a lot of resources. And she talks about, she got up, she did her talk, and all of a sudden this woman got up and she said, my name is Gertrude, and I like, what, I like you, I like what you're about, I like your mission, and I want to give you some money. She said, I think money is like water. For some people it comes into their lives like a rushing river. But for me, it comes into my life in a slow trickle. But she said, I do believe that it is my responsibility to direct that money that comes into my life to where it's going to do the most good for the most people. And so I have $50 in my wallet that I got from cleaning somebody else's house. But I want you to have it. I want you to have it. And she said, one by one, every person in that room stood up and came up front and gave her money. And at the end of that night, she had collected $500. $500. So she went back to her hotel room. She put it in a briefcase. She opened her briefcase, and there she saw this check for $50,000 and this $500 that they had given her. And she realized she had to return that check. Because that check was imbued with negative energy. The energy of guilt and fear. And she said, I believe that that $500 will do more good to ending world hunger than that $50,000 would. And so she returned the check with a letter to the CEO saying, I can't accept this money and this is why. That's a pretty powerful story. But then it didn't end there because she said years later she received a letter from this same CEO who had since retired and collected his retirement and was fairly wealthy, quite wealthy actually. And he sent her a letter and said, that 
interaction with you changed my life. It stuck with me all these years. And I've done research on the Hunger Project. I believe in what you're doing. And now I want to give you this money out of a sense of love and care and compassion and support for what you are doing and making a difference in the world. And enclosed in that letter was a check for $250,000. So I tell you that, I relay that because of what I said, that the energy of love, the energy has power to make a difference, to support what we value. And so when we're thinking about our money, let's think about it as an extension of our life energy that goes out into the world imbued with what we value. That's what she talks about, the soul of money. We give money its soul by imbuing it with our values. When we send that money out into the world, what are we valuing? What energy are we infusing that money with? Where are we sending it? What are we supporting? And what power does that energy as money have to contribute to the greater good, the greater whole? And so I started out by saying today that it's not my intention to get your money into the church's coffers, and it's not. But it is my hope and my prayer that you value this spiritual community, that it is part of what you value and you believe, and that you do believe, That what we are doing here embodies that spiritual value that you hold. Oneness, wholeness, support, spiritual growth, spiritual enlightenment, spiritual awakening. Because that's really what we're about. And I also want to say that if you don't, if there's anything in you that's resisting or withholding that, And I also invite you into that, to be curious about that, to be curious about why you might not be fully on board, and to make that known. Because it is true that we survive financially on the money that those of you who are part of this community contribute. And we, we are here, I hope, to make a difference in the world. Whether that's one life at a time, one child at a time. And I think that not only with our money, but with our time and our talent, You know, we are committed to family promise of Greater Denver. We are committed to making a difference through our use of our space, through our energy, through our resources, to making a difference in the lives of families who are experiencing homelessness. And by giving them a place to stay for a week, by feeding them for a week, by supporting them in their life, We are making a greater difference than we can possibly understand. Because when we do that, they know that someone cares about them. They know that their life has meaning to us. And so I encourage you to give of your time and your talent to these families to support them in this time in their lives. And to really consider, really consider your commitment to Unity Spiritual Center Denver and the work that we're doing, the ministry here. And to think about how you want to support that. Setting a clear intention 
for supporting the work that we are about, hopefully from a place of valuing it, from supporting it, from believing in what we're doing and imbuing all of that with your love, your love and your light. And so money can sometimes be a challenging thing to think about or talk about. But when we think about it as a source of sharing our love, giving to what we care about, then it becomes a spiritual practice. A spiritual practice of giving and sharing that which we are and that which we value. And so I want to also say to you, those of you who are contributors to this center financially, that we will be sending out a letter this week just asking for you to consider, to set an intention for how you want to support this center and the ministry that we are about. We ask for you to look at it, to think about it, to let us know something different. We haven't done this before. But just to think about it, to set a clear intention. Because what we know about setting an intention through our love and through our commitment is that everything shows up to support us in fulfilling that intention when it's clear and when it's based in love. And so there's no obligation. It's just a request. This is how we'd like for you to support the leadership in moving forward, in planning, And this is how we would like for us to come together as a community, setting a clear intention, deciding what we value, how we want to direct our resources, and how we can make the greatest impact and difference in the world.